Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. We're going to be reading Zephaniah, uh, starting in chapter 1. It's towards the end of the Old Testament. Um, I'll give you a moment to turn there. We're going to be starting in verse 7 and go through chapter 2, verse 3. This is what God's word says. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's son, sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traders are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. And at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Gather together, yes, gather, O shameless nation, before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who, ju who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. A heavy reading, I understand. A heavy reading. Um, as we begin, let me open our time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we need your light to understand your word. Some parts are hard to understand, but they were written for our instruction. So enlighten us now, we pray, as we study your word in the book of Zephaniah. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a trend a number of years ago you might have heard of called escape rooms. And these were rooms where you would be locked in and tasked with escaping before the time ran out. The way of escape came by solving really intricate puzzles, and it was always incredibly difficult in order to escape. And you would pay for this, mind you. And that is not unlike what we find in our passage now. A set amount of time is on the clock, called the day of the Lord, and the task is to escape before time runs out. And it's going to be incredibly difficult. But crucially, there is a way of possible escape. Well, we began a monthly series uh, through the book of the minor prophet Zephaniah. This is the second one in that series. Um, and we are looking at this book not as a historical document, but as a relevant text for our own times. What can we learn from this book as uh, Christians in the 21st century and in 21st century America? And from our text today, we should see that the day of the Lord is unavoidable, but there is perhaps a way of escape. And that brings us to our first point, the unavoidable day. 
the unavoidable day. That's chapter 1, verses 7 through 18. Well, Zephaniah continues his talk of the day of the Lord. And in our previous sermon, which you can find on our YouTube page, if you missed that one, I made a distinction between what we could call the big D day of the Lord, which happens at the end of human history. This is the day of judgment when Christ returns and judges the world in righteousness. And that is contrasted with the many little D days of the Lord that happen throughout the Bible. These are smaller versions of the day of judgment. And this is what Zephaniah means when he speaks of the day of the Lord. He is describing a local judgment on Judah and Jerusalem, not the entire cosmos. And now Zephaniah continues his talk of the day of the Lord with a feast scene. And this is no normal feast scene. This is a sacrificial meal that Yahweh is throwing for his guests. Yahweh calls Judah and Jerusalem to the feast, but shockingly, not as guests, but as the meal. As the meal. So who are the guests? Surprisingly, it's the birds of the air. They are his guests invited to the feast. So why the birds? Well, this is because it's judgment language. Throughout the Bible, when God plans destruction of a people, he calls in the birds. So, for example, Revelation 19 says this, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all of the birds that fly directly overhead, Come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both slave and free, both small and great. This actually is a direct reference to our passage in Zephaniah. And then also, likewise, you have in Deuteronomy 28, it says this, If you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And what is one of those curses? A little bit later it says this, And your dead body shall be food for all the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth, and there shall be no one to frighten them away. The birds were called in when God's covenant was broken. So the guests are called, and Israel is to be the meal. And this day is going to target every kind of person. Starting at the top, in verse 8, the officials and the king's sons. The leadership is first on the chopping block. But notice also that the king's sons, but not the king, um, that is because Josiah dies before this day comes. Josiah, the righteous king. But his sons face the wrath of Babylon. Um, Josiah sought the Lord, but they didn't. And this shows an important point. God doesn't have any grandchildren. Every one must have a personal relationship with God for themselves. You can't rest on the fact that your parents are Christian or your school is Christian or your culture is Christian or your family's been Christian for generations. You must trust in Jesus for yourself. And Josiah's three sons did what was evil in the sight of God. And for it, they were either killed or taken into exile. And not only the leaders, but also the priests those who treat the temple of God with disdain and violence. The phrase, those who leap over the threshold, is a reference to how Israel had adopted a superstitious practice of the Philistines, their priests. Um, And you can find that reference in 1 Samuel 5. But they had this practice where they jumped over the threshold every time they went in the temple because Dagon, their god, had fallen on the threshold. So here's Israel priests, Israel's priests, practicing this superstitious practice. Philistine priest practice um, while at the same time completely disregarding the law of God, doing pagan minutia but forgetting God. But not only the civil and religious leadership is to be judged, but every single citizen of Judah and Jerusalem must pass through this day. So in verse 13, Zephaniah names different parts of the city of Jerusalem. And it's as if it were, uh, we could see the invading Babylonian army start marching into the heart of the city, and the wail, as it does, goes up from the various districts. But what's amazing is that God himself says that he is the one going through the city. It's as if he is leading Babylon's army into the heart of Jerusalem, and he's doing a diligent nighttime house-to-house search for everyone in the city. 
and he's going to get all of those who have become complacent. Everyone who says in their heart, Yahweh is not going to do good. He's not going to do ill. They had become complacent because they thought God had become complacent. They thought God wasn't going to do anything, so they weren't going to do anything either. They weren't going to repent. They were going to thicken on wine, as the Hebrew says. One commentator put it this way, the great, cause, the great causes of God and humanity are not defeated by the hot assaults of the devil, but by the slow, crushing, glacier-like mass of thousands and thousands of indifferent nobodies. Indifferent nobodies. This is the sin of complacency. How about you? Is your life complacent? Is your faith complacent? And this demonstrates a fascinating truism, I think. We often act the way we think God acts. Have you ever noticed that? If you want to know what you think God is like, you can look at your life. If you think God is mean and unkind and critical, you will be mean and unkind and critical of others. If you think God is loving and generous and joyful, you will be loving and generous and joyful to others. And if, like the people in our passage, if you think that God's not doing anything about the world, he doesn't care good or ill, you won't either. But it's people like that that Yahweh has his sights on. He's going to do a lamp light search through the city for each of them. And of course, this is a reference to the last plague on Egypt, where Yahweh sends the destroyer through every Egyptian house to make a diligent search to kill the firstborn of the land. But the shock of it all is that instead of the Egyptians in God's sights, it's now Israel. Unbelievable words to Israelite ears. And this day is going to be awful. It's going to be an awful day. In verses 14 through 18, Zephaniah describes this day. He says, it's near and hastening fast. But keep in mind, this actually is 35 years away. So it's not immediate. God is still gracious in his timeline, but it's coming. 35 years. And he says, it's bitter and full of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, ruin and devastation, darkness and gloom, clouds and thick darkness, a day of the sound of war against their city. People will be so distressed and shell-shocked that they will walk, walk around like they're blind. And people's blood will be poured out like dust. And in Hebrew, their entrails will be poured out like dung. And perhaps the biggest surprise of it all is that the things they were trusting in to save them, namely their military power and their money, will be worthless on that day. People usually have, I think perhaps we all have, a mental contingency plan on how we're going to escape destruction at any given moment. In fact, you might have heard there's been a, a recent spike in something called billionaires bunkers. Um, these are luxury bunkers that the wealthier building so they can ride out the apocalypse in comfort. While poorer people around them die in mass, that shouldn't make them have to give up their luxurious lifestyle. They can just silence the screams in their jacuzzis and then come out when it's safe. Some have moats, some have automatic machine guns, and even flamethrowers to keep people out. But Zephaniah's point here is apt. If you are against Yahweh, good luck hiding. He will find you. Your money and your military power won't be able to save you. And often you could buy off a conqueror in the ancient world. If they came and ransacked your city, you just give them money and start paying tribute. But not this time. Babylon didn't want money because God had put into their hearts to want Israel's destruction. And instead, on that day, the mighty military warrior, even this one, will be shrieking in abject horror. Zephaniah tells them that the day is coming. It's coming swiftly, it's going to be awful, and the things that they are assuming will save them will be worthless on that day. Yahweh has set this day, and nothing they can do can prevent it now. It's on the calendar. Everyone, big and small, will go through it. It's unavoidable. That's the day of the Lord, according to Zephaniah. 
Okay. Heavy. Yes, heavy. But what does that mean for us? What does this mean for us? We all live outside of Israel and 2,500 years after Zephaniah. So does this passage have anything to say for us? The answer, of course, is yes. Zephaniah here is using covenantal language throughout this passage. If you notice in, in, uh, back in our previous sermon, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, he references Noah, the, allu- the allusion to the destruction of creation. And then in verses 7 and 8 today, he alludes to the covenantal sacrifice that God made with Abraham. And then in verses 15 and 16, he alludes to Mount Sinai language. That is because Zephaniah is alluding to covenantal language. He is alluding to covenant breakers. If you remember, there were four sins that we looked at last time that Israel was guilty of. The first one was syncretism, which is basically trusting in Yahweh plus something else. The second was idolatry, having something higher in your heart than Yahweh. The third was trusting in political leaders, trusting in man instead of Yahweh. And then those who no longer called upon Yahweh, trusting, as it were, in yourself rather than Yahweh. These were the complacent people. So how does this apply to us? Well, the covenant people of God are different now. The covenant people of God are different now. It is no longer based on nationality. That's why the debate, I believe, about whether America is a Christian nation or not is moot. God doesn't covenant with nations anymore. America is not the chosen people, and neither is modern Israel. So who are the chosen people now? Well, it's very clear, isn't it? It's the church, of course. It's the church. We are his called out ones, his chosen people, the city within the city. Uh, Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What you may notice if you're um, uh, uh, versed in Exodus, is, or yeah, in, in Exodus 19, is that that's the same exact language that God gave to Moses for the nation of Israel. That was when God covenanted with Israel as a nation, and Peter takes that same language of the holy priesthood, a chosen nation, and now says it applies to the church. That's, that's, what the, that's who the covenant of people of God are now. God only covenants now with his church, the people of his Messiah. Israel doesn't have a separate national plan. They will have to come to the Messiah as individuals like everyone else. They must belong to the church if they are to be saved, just like Messianic Jews are are doing right now. Not two plans, but one. Either you're a believer in Jesus and therefore are right with God, or you are not. Notice also that many of these same sins and warnings of judgment that are leveled against Israel and Zephaniah are leveled in Revelation against the seven churches of Asia Minor. And notice that in Revelation, John's letters are written to the seven churches, not to the nation they are living in, namely Asia Minor. John doesn't go, okay, Asia Minor, as a nation, you need to get your act together. No, he writes to these seven individual churches. And notice that the churches don't stand or fall together. They're not grouped as one in a bundle. Each church has to answer for itself. Some churches are doing well, some are not. And like in the time of Zephaniah, there are some even within those churches that are doing poorly that will be saved like a faithful remnant of Judah and Jerusalem. So for example, Revelation 3, 4 says this, Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So there's some within that church of Sardis, within the region of Asia Minor, who are worthy. So judgment will come on the church of Sardis, but there are some there who have remained faithful. And that's how covenant keeping and covenant breaking work now. Not national, ecclesial. Each church must answer for itself. And within each church, each individual must answer for themselves. 
So in a sense, churches now can go through days of the Lord. This is what John means when he says that Jesus is threatening to put out the lampstand in response to their faithlessness to him. So this very much applies to us, and we be, need to be mindful both of that big D day of the Lord at the end of time and the little D days of the Lord that are going on throughout history and church history. There are times that happen upon the world and the church as a way to test the faithfulness of God's people and what they are really trusting in. Perhaps it is one of those days we are experiencing now. But we don't stand or fall as a nation, but as a church and as individuals. So if these days are set on the calendar and we must go through them, what is the way of escape? And this brings us to our second point. Our second point, perhaps a way of escape. So our first point, the unavoidable day. Second, perhaps a way of escape. So in verse 2-1, Zephaniah continues the imagery of Yahweh's feast. He calls to the feast the shameless nation. The shameless nation. nation. The hearts of the shameless cannot allow them to admit that they are wrong or even to have a moment of self-reflection. And even worse, Yahweh calls them a nation, but in Hebrew, a goy, a goy. This was a term used for other nations, never Israel. This, they were no longer acting like the set-apart, special, holy people of God and instead had become just like everyone else. But with that heavy name laid on them, Yahweh still graciously calls them to this feast. And now, instead of it being entirely a morbid feast, there is a glimmer of hope to be found. Yahweh says to them, Come to this feast day before that day arrives. Now they, instead of the birds, are his guests. And with verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2, we see another side of this feast emerge. Whereas before you should come to the feast to be food for the birds, now you can either partake of Yahweh's sacrificial feast before the day of the Lord, or once that day has come, you now become the partaken of as the feast. The judgment is there, but now there is a possible way of escape. Okay, so what does it look like to be a partaker of this feast properly before the day arrives? Well, Zephaniah gives three things that are crucial to escape the coming judgment. These are the three things he lists. First, you can escape that day by seeking Yahweh, by seeking Yahweh. You can find this in uh, chapter 2, verse 3. By seeking Yahweh. This means making Yahweh a priority above everything else in your life. Getting rid of the syncretism, the idolatry, the trusting in political leaders, the not calling on him at all. Having a relationship with him, communing with him, worshiping him, caring about what he cares about. And it, of course, means admitting your sins to him and trusting in the salvation that he is offering. That's what it means to seek the Lord. Okay, and then the second thing is that you can escape this day by seeking righteousness, along with seeking Yahweh, has to come a seeking to do his will, living rightly, letting him dictate what is good in your life, even when it makes you feel like a servant doing someone else's bidding, because that is exactly what a life with God looks like. But even more than that, it's paradoxically being overjoyed that someone else is telling you how to live your life and you're praising them for it. I can't think of anything more countercultural in our age right now than letting someone else tell you how to live and you praising them for it. But this is what seeking righteousness looks like. And then third, Yahweh says that you can escape this day by seeking meekness. So seeking Yahweh, seeking righteousness, seeking meekness. Meekness is one of those words, by the way, that's in the Hebrew. You won't see it in the English. I think it's humility, if I remember correctly. But it's it's. In the Hebrew, meekness. And what is meekness? It's one of those words that we all kind of understand but really have a hard time defining. I've arrived at this definition that I find very helpful. Meekness is humility towards power. Meekness is humility towards power. No doubt you've heard of the story of Cinderella, but perhaps you don't know that in the original Brothers Grimm version of the story, 
the evil stepsisters, when it's told that someone's foot needs to fit in this glass slipper and that's going to be the princess, in order to secure that becoming princess for themselves, they decide to cut off their toes and their heels. It's pretty, pretty morbid. Um, but that's in contrast to the meekness of Cinderella, who was abused by them but didn't retaliate. The stepsisters were trying to secure power and prominence in their own hands, or feet as it were, and it did not work. They wanted the power, they wanted the prominence, it did not work. And it didn't help in Zephaniah's day either. Meekness is crucial in escaping the day of the Lord because at its core, meekness is not looking to your own hand for your deliverance. And it's also crucial in escaping the big D day of the Lord at the end of time. As Jesus says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And fascinatingly, it was precisely these people in Zephaniah's day, the meek, who inherited what was left of Judah and Jerusalem. So for example, in uh, 2 Kings 25, it says this, and the rest of the people who were left in the city, that is Jerusalem, and the deserters who had not, uh, and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon, together with the rest of the multitude, Nebuzaradan, excuse me, Nebuzaradan, Buzardon, the captain of the guard, carried into exile. So all of those people, the captain of the guard carried into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. Everyone in Judah and Jerusalem was carried off, even and especially the defectors who had early said, well, I'm switching to team Babylon so that when they capture us, I'll be cool. That didn't work. And instead, only the meekest of the land were left. They inherited the land. It literally happened. And the Fairweather fans, as I pointed out, met the same fate as everyone else. Their attempts, like the attempts of the stepsisters to save themselves, entirely backfired. So how about you? Are you seeking the Lord? Are you seeking righteousness? Are you seeking meekness? Does your life bear that out. Then perhaps bizarrely, Zephaniah says that seeking Yahweh, seeking righteousness, and seeking meekness will, quote, perhaps allow a way of escape. Saying perhaps here doesn't necessarily bolster the greatest amount of confidence. It feels like if Zephaniah was in seminary, he would get critiqued here for not making his gospel call robust enough. But I think Zephaniah is making a really deep point. The way of salvation is virtually impossible. It is virtually impossible for humans to be saved. Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? And Jesus put it this way. In Matthew 7, 13, and 14, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And this is a great reminder, isn't it, that the only way, the only way that anyone is saved is by the power of God. It is by the power and the righteousness of God and not by our own. That's how sinful we are. That's how deficient every single one of our good works are. And further, notice that seeking Yahweh, seeking righteousness, and seeking meekness doesn't cancel the day of the Lord from happening or keeping people from having to go through that day, but only that it perhaps provides a way of escape in that day. So the day of the Lord is unavoidable, but there is perhaps a way of escape as you go through it. But don't we have to ask the question here for a moment? Don't we have to pause and ask the question? Doesn't Zephaniah's description of how to be saved contradict justification by faith alone? If justification by faith alone is true, why does Zephaniah add seeking righteousness and seeking meekness to seeking Yahweh. Isn't that enough? But no, in fact, this is a good reminder 
There is no tension in God telling people to do good works along with justification by faith alone. I want to be very clear. The doctrine of justification by faith alone, apart from works, is true and scriptural. But there is a false version of it that says, I'm forgiven of everything. It does not matter how I live. I don't need to follow God's commandments. I don't need repentance. I don't need to take up my cross. Or to use the terms from Zephaniah, I don't need righteousness. I don't need meekness. But that is not justification by faith alone. That, James says, is the faith that demons have. And it will not save. Demons believe, they shudder at God, but they don't repent. And as James rightly reminds us, faith without works is dead. It's interesting to me, there was the godly uh, German pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And at a certain point in his life, as he opposed the ways of Hitler in his own German Protestant church, that he started to doubt, as a Lutheran, the doctrine of justification by faith alone. He never forsook it, but he did start to question it. And the reason is he looked around at all of his fellow German Protestant Lutheran ministers and he saw them supporting Hitler. And he wondered how people with the supposed correct view of justification could be so full of hate and lacking in righteousness. He believed the churches of German of the German Reformation had taught many marvelous things about the Christian freedom, the triumph of grace, but the churches had not built loving hearts. In other words, he saw firsthand how faith without works is dead. So when we see Yahweh through Zephaniah add that people must seek righteousness and meekness in order to be saved, we should not bristle. The doing of righteousness is in no way at tension with the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And in fact, according to Yahweh, it's the only possible way of escape. Okay, so I know how heavy all of this is. This is a very heavy sermon. You guys are only hearing this for a half an hour. I've been swimming in these waters for weeks now. It's very heavy, I know. So in a passage full of judgment like this, that is indeed the very word of God that must be preached, how do we see the gospel? Well, even in the warnings from Zephaniah's day, there's still hope being offered. Yahweh is beckoning the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem to come to the feast before the day arrives so they can find the way of escape. But this is also not unlike the big D-Day of the Lord that will happen at the end of human history when we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ as Paul writes. The real question is whether or not, the real question is whether you come to the feast early or late. Those who come to the feast early will call upon the Lord in sincerity and pursue righteousness and meekness and be saved, not by their righteousness or their meekness or even necessarily their sincerity, but upon the goodness of God who offers it. That is the core of the salvation. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And there is no, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For you see, here's the gospel. All of the horrors of that day have already come for those who trust in Christ. In the Lord's Supper, we are called to a feast that commemorates, not performs, but commemorates when that righteous host's body was ripped apart and partaken of so that the guests could escape the day of wrath set on the calendar. His body was broken so theirs didn't have to be. In that feast, the host's blood gets poured out instead of that of the covenant breakers. The cloud of thick darkness has already passed over him on the cross so that his guests can escape. He is the gracious host who volunteers his own uh, body to undergo wrath so that The covenant breakers don't have to. So, what about you? Are you coming to this feast to partake of this Savior by faith? Put your trust in him before the day arrives. This is the way of escape. Okay, and as we conclude, I have two brief uh, applications for us from this passage. First, there are people asking whether 
America is going through of the, a day of the Lord right now. I mentioned this in my last sermon. But the real question is not whether America is going through a day of the Lord, but whether the church is going through a day of the Lord. So the takeaway is, whatever swirls around you, you follower of Jesus, in this tumultuous year, the one thing that will not change is that Jesus is ruling on his throne right now, and nothing will shake that. That is where our trust must be. That's where our hearts need to be, even in an election year. So we can say with the psalmist, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. May this be true of us as we look to Jesus, our Savior, for leadership. So America may be going through a day of the Lord, but that doesn't mean that the church necessarily is. As with Rome, the downfall of that empire very well may mean great blessings for the church now. It was a great blessing when Rome was overthrown for the church. Maybe that could be the case now. Who knows? But what it means is that we should be asking at times like this, are we at Westminster trusting in Jesus as our leader through these tough times? Are we being faithful to him? Are you as a Christian trusting in Jesus as the leader of your life? Or are you trusting in princes? Are you following Jesus or the world for guidance right now? Are you following Jesus in, the righteousness, in righteousness and meekness? Or are you going your own way? When times are tough, are you leaning on Jesus or your idols? And our second point of application as we conclude, are you resting in a false view of justification? Do you falsely believe that it does not matter how you live because of your trust in Christ? Do you bristle when God in his word tells you how to live? Do you bristle when God demands good works from you in order to obtain salvation? I want to be very clear that our good not works do not save us, but faith without good works will not save. Faith without works is dead. This is why the same writer, John, can famously say in his gospel, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And yet, also write the same letter to the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent." Yes, we are saved by faith, faith alone, but if that doesn't result in good works, we don't have saving faith. So how about you? Is your faith living or is your faith dying? If it's living, rejoice that it's only by the power of God that it is. And if, if it is dying, seek the Lord, seek righteousness, seek meekness, and find the possible way of escape. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this is heavy. These are heavy things from your word, but we don't want to skip over it. We don't want to just read the parts that assure us that we are fine. We want to do godly self-reflection. We want to let your word diagnose us. Let your word diagnose our faith and let us um, see clearly our relationship with you. May we not just become complacent but may we always be people who seek your face, seek righteousness, seek meekness. Help us to do this by the power of your Holy Spirit, for it is by that alone that we can do any spiritual good whatsoever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.